As a Cesar uh, GU program manager, then the, the, our work is not to, to manage a project, it's program, a set of uh, projects that is aiming at delivering the, the benefits um, without considering the individual benefits of each of the projects. The overall set of projects is bringing benefits at the program level. This is the, the way we, we work. Then this morning, you had the bunch of uh, six VLD. Now, this industrial research project, PG34, Aura, uh, which is aiming at uh, managing the integration, the interface between ATM, ATM and, and U-Space uh, with two solutions. To do that, I will invite on scene the, the three colleagues. First of all, uh, Julian Alonso, who is a project coordinator. He is working in Indra on ATM for more than 15 years with an expertise in software architecture and ATM uh, interoperability. And now he's uh, leading uh, PG34 and also uh, coordinating Indra's contribution to different uh, Cesar initiatives as a contribution manager. We have also uh, the solution, uh, one leader uh, who is uh, uh, Marta. Uh, Marta, she is an area space engineer working with Indra on Cesar projects, uh, especially in the field of uh, U-Space, eh, then for sure. She brings five years of experience in the context of uh, Cesar uh, projects. Much more to say, but I would like to be quick and uh, make the link with uh, Pablo. And Pablo, who is the leader for Solution 2, Pablo is an also an aeronautical engineer working with CRIDA, the research and development uh, center owned by uh, ENER, uh, with more than 20 years of experience in uh, ATM and R&D, and then drones and uh, uh, U-Space uh, domain. You, you put UTM, I change it to U-Space, okay? And since uh, 2016, he's involved in diverse initiatives concerning youth space and uh, particularly uh, Cesar projects like Impetus in the past, DACUS, and now uh, PG34. Then, please, the scene is yours. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you uh, for, uh, for the introduction. I hope you are not uh, too sleepy after the, uh, the lunch. Um, so, this uh, project is uh, regarding uh, interoperability, integration in ATM and US space. And in terms of uh, partnership, uh, Indra is leading the project uh, uh, as coordinator. Uh, and we have a good mix of different uh, stakeholders, uh, air and ground industries, uh, to consider uh, research centers, uh, different NSPs uh, from the different countries, and also the control. So we are uh, really confident that uh, we are uh, meeting the uh, project uh, objectives uh, that are very ambitious. So um, before going to this uh, slide, uh, the project is a uh, uh, CESAR 2020 project, industrial research, uh, wave three. That means that uh, we were half uh, just uh, uh, two years and a half uh, to address uh, the two solutions we are having. The most of our exercises has been already executed, but uh, we are still uh, analyzing the results, but uh, we can anticipate some of them uh, in today's presentation. The objective is um, addressing one of the key topics that uh, we have been mentioned this morning, uh, for example, by Philippe Cornelis, that is the integration and interoperability between AUS space and ATM. Uh, developing the requirement uh, concept of, oper of operations uh, and validating U.S. space services and information exchange uh, um, between U.S. Uh, space and ATM. Our projects identified and developed the requirements for U.S. space and also for ATM uh, regarding information exchange uh, through SWIM. Uh, and we are validating as, uh, as, as a, a set of selected uh, U.S. space services. So it's, it, it's also uh, defining a novel uh, concept of, of operation for the integration uh, of U.S. space and ATM, uh, introducing uh, also uh, the dynamic use of airspace uh, to ensure uh, safe operations. In our project, we are having two different solutions uh, with two different uh, maturity levels. We are having solution one that is a target interior four. It's uh, focusing in, uh, in information exchange uh, services, identifying and defining the interfaces between the space and ATM. Uh, and, and, and this is addressing a medium-term concept uh, where no so many uh, 
uh, users of the experts uh, and, and know uh, many digitalization and, 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 and advanced uh, features. So um, uh, we are also having another solution that is uh, uh, targeting uh, TRL2, uh, but this is uh, more focusing in uh, a, a medium and long-term concept uh, for a collaborative uh, ATM IU space environment, uh, facilitating the seamless operation uh, of managed and unmanaged uh, aviation uh, with high level of automation and uh, with the use of uh, fully uh, dynamic uh, airspace. So um, for further details, I will pass, uh, I will give the floor uh, for, for um, uh, Marta that uh, will explain uh, solution one. So let's go now on further details regarding solution one. As Julian has already introduced, we are searching just the validation of five basic services, looking for the generation of this ATM US based interface we were talking about in the previous slides. So the aim we have is to just talk about the information exchange between ATM and US based parts. So ATM with CSP and CSP with USSP, so that this is the main part of our architecture. Going through these services, we have operation plan that uh, manages the whole process of authorization and activating the operational plan uh, in itself, so that it also consider a space changes. Then we have tracking in a way that tracks uh, are shared between the stakeholders, and we also have position and velocity as other relevant inputs. Then tactical operational message, just to make the consumer of the service aware of its uh, area of interest and what's happening there, alerts or uh, instruction and these kind of issues. And then traffic non-conformance, uh, when we talk about a drone that is deviating from its trajectory. And that's last but not least, geofence, just introduce geofence restrictions and other space restrictions too. So if you see this figure below, this figure represents the main architecture of uh, Solution 1, so that we have the ATM site represented by ANSP and the US space part represented by CSP, USSP, and UAS operators. Uh, these five services fit into the link between these two parts, so that we have SWIM as a main middleware between both sides to, to allow this interchange of information. Then um, one of the main objectives of solution one, or the main challenges, let's say, was to see how we could structure these validation exercises. We wanted just to cover all type, or maybe most parts of ATS, ATC systems, and also uh, different practices in other countries. So our best approach was just to structure this in clusters. These clusters are focused in different geographical areas and validate different set of services. So this is a way of achieving a divide and conquer approach and also covering this wide variety of ATC systems. So these are the clusters we have in solution two. Cluster one is led by Indra and based in Spain. Cluster two led by Frequenties and based in Austria and Hungary. Cluster three led by DSNA and based in France. And finally, cluster four led by Leonardo and based in Italy. So now you may be wondering, uh, okay, we have like five services, four clusters. How are we going to manage this? Okay, so the idea is to validate almost uh, 17 use cases. So you may imagine how this uh, challenging is because we are validating a wide variety of different scenarios. These are just some examples of it. So that we have, for example, UAS navigate calibration that is interrupted by a man aircraft emergency. We have aerial missions uh, crossing two countries so that we can validate how we can connect between two different countries. Uh, sorted the confliction involving ATC. Also, main aircraft emergency, which may lead to a dynamic airspace reservation and other non nominal uh, contingency situations. So, that um, we have now to look 
and say, okay, we are almost finalizing these validations. What we have achieved, which are the behaviors we have derived from the validation exercises. So let's say this is a quick summary of some of the preliminary results and maybe the most relevant ones. For example, the first one and most obvious, uh, interoperability has improved. But this is not the only thing. We have get to increase safety and safe, uh, security in operations. And indeed, this process has been identified as a reliable and useful process to lead to the uh, generation of new standards and also to promote and reach the expected economic uh, potential of the drone market, which is very important nowadays. Indeed, uh, sharing and being able to display US based airspace, it's uh, a way of improving the situational awareness of the host of the both sides, ATM and US based. And uh, another thing that we find really important is air traffic controllers giving us the confidence and the acceptance of this concept. This is really important for us because it's the most affected part at this stage so that they have been able to develop their tasks in a timely and efficient manner. Roles have been correctly adequated, defi defined and differentiated so that each stakeholder is clear on what it has to do in each part of this architecture. So this, uh, these are the main results from solution one. And now I want to give the floor to my colleague Pablo, who is going to go one step further in this project with a more long-term solution. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to present the second solution within Aura. We need to distinguish between the two of them because there is a major assumption that makes uh, the difference, especially with regards to the maturity level. In solution two, we are assuming a very high number of drone operations in controlled airspace. And this difference makes it necessary uh, to avoid uh, having individual approvals of each drone operation plan into controlled airspace. Controller will not be able to deal with such number of drone operations. This is one point. And the other point is that we tried uh, to use as much as, as much as possible this idea of dynamic airspace management in order to ensure that the drones and manned aviation are separated, safe separated within yeah, CTR, TMA, within controlled airspace. And, and well, within this context, we have defined three, let's say, sub-solutions, operational improvements, three steps. The first one is to introduce such a high number of drones into very low level airspace. So the controller will be able to see those drones in very low level. Uh, they will be separated through the dynamic airspace management, but there are no drones, there will be no drones into higher altitudes, uh, which implies further interactions. The next one increases the complexity. We have drones operating above very low level airspace, and also we will have some sort of automation to support the controller to do the tasks. And, and well, and finally, we have the most ambitious operational improvement which is that really most of the airspace will be delegated to US space and the managed aviation, each aircraft, will have some sort of bubbles to separate versus uh, drones operations. You can imagine that at the end we should go into this well, lack of segregation, operations together, which will be for me a step further. Well, what are the challenges to be addressed? Uh, first, I didn't say numbers, but now I say we will have 10 more times of drone operations than manned aviation, you can imagine. Uh, then there will be some operation, or most of the operations will, will be beyond visual line of sight, and also some of them will be autonomous operation. That will mean that the controller will not be able to directly deal with voice communications with a remote pilot, for instance. What else? The level of automation. We have ATC, which is human-centric control, and we have US space, which is an automated system. So there could be some problems to integrate both systems, especially when the controller has to instruct in some way 
not directly the drones, we will see later, but to, to manage some instructions. And, and this will imply that he is not separating the drones. No? This is something to be understood. Automation is supporting the process. Who is doing the dynamic aerospace management? There should be a role that the, deals with the, this tactical management of the aerospace. Uh, we have identified that this, for sure, should be done by, let's say, the ATC, but it could happen that this is a different role. It could happen that this is done by the controllers in frequency, thanks to the automation. And, and what else? And finally, very challenging contingencies, non-nominal cases, in which some changes are affecting this dynamic aerospace management within what we have called the AUSA aerospace. ATM, U-space, shared aerospace within the controlled aerospace, of course. We define the concept and we have performed, recently performed, six different exercises, mainly testing safety, testing human performance, and, and more or less you can see they are the responsible, the, the companies in charge. Uh, Enaire has performed one simulation addressing human factors versus automation in nominal conditions. Then we have 81 that has, do, has completed a similar approach, but focusing on the contingencies. Uh, then we have Indra, sorry, because uh, Indra performed two exercises. This is a mistake in the second one. Uh, Indra assess uh, how the drone flight uh, format should be defined in order to be shared with ATC and also how to share some specific information to allow filtering of the drones, to allow to manage this type of operations which are emerging there, 10 more than managed aviation, as I said. Uh, and then we have the most challenging exercises. One fast simulation performed by Arbas in order to test how to deal with this dynamic aerospace reconfiguration through the planning phases and interactions with strategic and, and tactical conflict resolution services. And finally, uh, the most ambitious one for me, no? the, the idea of the addressing the US space resilience to minimize disruptions. You can see there in the image the bubble around the Manata aircraft, which is going into the US space aerospace. What are the preliminary results? And I say preliminary because, excuse me, but we have just finished the six exercises. We are progressing with the report, but really this is only the perspective of the exercise performed by Enaire. Uh, and first, uh, what we see is that in a city air, with low complexity, imagine Valencia, uh, the situational awareness of the controller with regards to the manned aircraft uh, did not change because of this set of drone operations uh, in, the, in the segregated US space aerospace. However, it is true that the, it was not easy for the controller to deal with the tasks associated to the dynamic aerospace management. And this is because these tasks should be done with some sort of uh, some time in advance, let's say. No? Imagine you have an helicopter which is going into a new space aerospace, you need to plan some minutes before uh, in order to segregate and to ensure that by means of geofencing, there are no drones in the area where he's, he's landing. So, okay, this integration of, uh, let's say, planet actions, planet tasks with those in order to ensure the separation was causing some difficulties, let's say. And what else? Then the, the, the need to improve trust on automation because, uh, well, finally the controller is not separating the drones. It's giving instructions to ensure geofence, to ensure safe segregation, and this implies that suddenly, okay, uh, aircraft are not reacting as they were expecting or as quickly as they were expecting. So there are some challenges with regards to the automation and, and and how to deal with, with the behavior of the automation. And uh, well, that's all. These are the contacts you have seen, uh, Julian, Marta, the rest of the contacts uh, within Indra and, and Crida. And also, of course, we have an stand there. You can go to see further details on the exercises. Thank you very much.